This is Medical Device Legal News. Today is July 18th, 2023. I'm Sam Bernstein. On June 26, Matthew Kopapianko, a former Depew Synthesis sales representative, was arrested for defrauding a Boston area hospital and lying to federal authorities regarding his interference with the hospital's serialization processes. From January 2016 through June 2017, in order to increase his sales numbers, Matthew allegedly falsely reported that additional and more expensive Depew products were used during spine surgeries than were actually used. In addition, Matthew allegedly himself brought and instructed a subordinate to bring non-sterile spinal implants to a scheduled surgery in violation of hospital sterilization policies. Luckily, the hospital staff confiscated the non-sterile implants before they were used. Capabianco faces combined sentences of up to 25 years in prison and fines of up to $500,000. While this case is an example of an alleged bad actor sales representative, it serves as a good example for the need to ensure that sales representatives are subject to appropriate oversight and that medical device manufacturers periodically conduct sales audits and compliance checks on their sales teams. On June 30th, Alamo City Pain Consultants LLC, doing business as the Institute for Functional Health, as well as Psych Dimensions Incorporated and Lambert and Moore Enterprises Incorporated, agreed to settlements totaling over $500,000 to resolve allegations that they improperly billed Medicare for P-STEM devices. The practices allegedly billed Medicare for implanting neurostimulators when in fact they provided non-covered P-STEM devices to their patients, which are electroacupuncture devices that go behind a patient's ear. This is a good reminder for medical device manufacturers to be careful in providing billing, coding, and reimbursement advice to their customers. Providing erroneous billing, coding, or claim submission advice to their customers can expose medical device manufacturers to significant liability under the False Claims Act for causing their customers to submit false claims. In addition, sales representatives uh, should not generally be allowed to provide off-the-cuff billing and coding advice to customers due to the risk that sales representatives may provide erroneous or false advice to customers, potentially exposing themselves as well as their employer manufacturer to significant liability under the False Claims Act if ultimately they provided bad advice to the company's customers. On June 30th, Alexander Schleider pled guilty to a charge of conspiracy to commit healthcare fraud and wire fraud. Schleider owned durable medical equipment companies in New Jersey that provided medically unnecessary orthotic braces to Medicare beneficiaries and beneficiaries of other third-party payers. Schleider allegedly paid kickbacks and bribes to marketing call centers to obtain fraudulent prescriptions for durable medical equipment sold by his companies. He also submitted a fraudulent attestation to support his company's receipt of COVID-19 provider relief funds. Schleider faces up to 30 years in prison and up to $500,000 in fines. This case is another example of the DOJ prosecuting durable medical equipment companies for supplying medically unnecessary equipment and illegally purchasing fraudulent orders. As we've mentioned in prior weeks, medical device manufacturers should be careful in engaging third-party marketing companies to ensure that they provide services in a compliant manner and do not engage in illegal activities such as purchasing fraudulent orders. On June 27th, Tamara Yvonne Motley was found guilty of 20 counts of healthcare fraud two counts of aggravated identity theft, and one count of conspiracy to commit money laundering. From June 2006 to August 2014, Motley was the de facto owner of a number of companies, including Action Metal Equip Equipment and Supplies and of Kaja Medical Equipment and Supply. Motley allegedly paid marketers for patient referrals and directed the referrals to corrupt physicians who allegedly prescribed medically unnecessary durable medical equipment that Motley's companies billed to Medicare. Botley's company is also allegedly billed for medically unnecessary repairs to power wheelchairs. Botley faces up to 10 years in prison for each count of healthcare fraud, up to 20 years for money laundering conspiracy, and a mandatory sentence of two years for aggravated identity theft. On June 28th, the FDA released draft guidance regarding information that should be included in regulatory submissions for patient match guides for orthopedic implants. Patient match guides are intended to position an orthopedic implant in a way consistent with the implant's intended use based on landmarks identified using preoperative patient images. The guidance is not intended to comprehensively address all considerations and requirements to ensure that such guides comply with quality system requirements, but rather address the information should, that should be included in regulatory submissions 
for such patient matched guides. As you're likely aware, the FDA's guidance documents do not establish legally enforceable responsibilities unless specific regulatory or statutory requirements are cited. And if and when finalized, such guidance documents rather describe what the agency's current thinking is on a topic and should be viewed as recommendations. The guidance provides that for class two and class three devices, manufacturers must establish and maintain design controls consistent with FDA requirements. In addition, manufacturers should adopt procedures for monitoring and control parameters for validated processes to ensure that requirements continue to be met. If process results cannot be fully verified by subsequent inspection and testing, this process must be validated with a high degree of assurance and approved according to established procedures. The FDA has interpreted these requirements to effectively require validation procedures for patient match guides to ensure that the device can perform as intended. The guidance provides that a design template with a range of pre-specified allowable design parameters should be developed for patient match guides. The design process template should include patient image acquisition, image quality control, segmentation, and anatomical definitions, preoperative planning and healthcare provider concurrence, a definition of the guide's design and patient match features, and the guide construction, as well as preparing and cleaning and sterilization processes to use with the, the patient match guide, and the surgical techniques that, are, that should be used with the guide. The surgical technique description for use with the guide must be consistent with the technique recommended by the implant manufacturer with which the guide will be used. The guidance also provides that the indications for use of a patient match guide should include the surgical approach and procedure supported, the implant systems the guide is intended to support, the patient population for which the guide is intended, including whether that patient population is a subset of the implant system's population, the types of imaging that are necessary for designing the guides, and the anatomical landmarks necessary for preoperative planning. The guidance also addresses the need for the guide's biocompatibility, including potentially referencing a consensus standard or a letter of authorization for a device master file, as well as following the FDA's guidance regarding ISO 10993-1 biological evaluation of medical devices. In addition, the guidance provides that patient matched guides must either be provided sterile to the user or must be single use user end sterilized devices with an indicated shelf life. In addition, the guidance requires a number of different categories of non clinical performance testing, including intra and inter design variability, mechanical integrity, debris generation, and implant alignment accuracy and guide usability. The FDA raised concerns regarding patient match guides that come into contact with cutting devices or scalpels or other surgical cutting tools uh, in that may result in debris generation, which could end up in a wound. And the performance testing should accordingly include testing on the types of cutting tools and devices used in connection with the cutting guide. However, the guidance provides that clinical performance testing, as opposed to non-clinical performance testing, is generally not necessary to support regulatory evaluation of orthopedic patient match guides. If such testing is required, the FDA is taking the position that the guides are significant risk devices subject to IDE requirements. The guidance also identifies certain changes or modifications that the FDA would view as requiring a 510K for the patient match guide, including a modification to the design of the patient contact regions of the guide, changes in the planning process, including automating manual segmentation, a change to the patient imaging modality, as well as changes to the anatomic contact location. Uh, that list is uh, not exclusive. There may be other changes to a device consistent with the FDA's prior 510K guidance that would require the submission of a 510K for a patient match guide. Thank you for joining me this week for Medical Device Legal News. I'm Sam Bernstein, a partner in McGuire-Woods Healthcare Group. I would also like to thank my colleague Sophie Moros for helping to make today's program possible. I look forward to seeing you next time.